The Buffalo Bills start Wednesday out with a blockbuster trade, sending Stefan Diggs to the Houston Texans. This week on the Wandering Buffalo Podcast. You're now listening to the Wandering Buffalo Podcast with your host, Justin Goddard. Bills Mafia, welcome in and thank you for joining me on this week's episode of the Wandering Buffalo Podcast, a show on the Buffalo Fanbase Podcast Network. My name is Justin and I will be your host today and just want to start this off at the top and uh, go ahead and say that we have a bit of a change of plans this week. Um, Anybody that listened to the show last week, um, the plan for this week's episode was to run through some mock drafts, play out some scenarios, see how it all goes. Um, Had that episode fully recorded yesterday, about to release this morning. Um, And, you know, then I look at my phone and the Bills have traded Stefan Diggs, um, which rendered all of my mock drafts completely null and void, changed all of our priorities. Um... So I'm going to go ahead and just scrap that scrap that whole episode, um, and we will revisit some mock drafts here. Um, but yeah, obviously some pretty wild breaking news. Um, news that I personally have to eat a whole bunch of crow on. Um, I've had so many conversations with so many people about just the impossibility of digs being traded. Um, just due to the financial implications and didn't seem to matter to Brandon Bean. Um, kind of get into my thoughts on all of that, but this is a situation that the my initial reaction to it is very different than what I kind of talk myself into. Um, and it's it's really hard to fully flush out how I'm feeling about it until we get to August, September, um, the football games start being played, and we see how this all plays out. Um, the initial reaction, it was just a swift kick in the nuts. Um, not only did we lose our number one receiver... Um, who's been super productive Um, but it it actually costs more to have him not on the roster this year um, than for him to be here Um, so the Bills taking on 31 million dollars in dead cap this year and not only that you have to replace that number one receiver Um, it sucks Stefan Diggs has been one of my favorite players um over the last few years on the bills uh there's a certain degree of you know his social media his twitter the cryptic stuff that's annoying but wasn't super bothersome to me um but when i'm looking at this situation i i can't help but to feel like the relationship between him and the organization had soured more than we'd really seen um and I think this kind of might go back to to last year with all the offseason stuff. I think maybe we saw some some duct tape on it to get through the season. Um, but those relationships never really being fully mended. Um, and it kind of resurfacing again now. Um, I believe it was like a $12 million dead cap hit if they had waited to do this till next year. Um, and I think production was still there for Diggs. So kind of tells me that the relationship had gone so sideways that it wasn't going to be beneficial to wait another year here. Um, and Brandon Bean got it done. Um, for, for my kind of bigger picture view set on this, it also seems to me like Brandon Bean is very set on kind of resetting the roster, resetting the cap. And to me, to me, for my opinion, it's kind of like 
Bean has decided this was his medicine year. Um, we see that, you know, not fully re not doing the full restructure on Josh Allen, um, letting some of these aging players, fan favorites go. Um, when you're talking about Boyer, Hyde, Trey, um, just a bevy of players. And now we see Stefan Diggs. And this is where I start like thinking of the bigger picture of it. And do I think in the immediate short term, this, this is kind of a step back for the team? Yes. Um, but that kind of goes into, he's still got four or five months to build out this roster. Um, and I think this is kind of the thing that has to be done and Bean's doing it now that allows him to reset to make sure we're this competitive um, throughout the second half of Allen's career here. And we've seen it over the past three, four years. It's kind of been keeping this core together, um, you know, paying pieces, pushing money into the future, and the team wasn't able to get over the hump, and it, it, it it came time for the bills to be due. Um, and this is kind of, like I said, the medicine year. Could have, you know, doubled down and kept some of that core together again and tried to do another run, but these players were just, you know, getting another year older. I think it was time for a reset at some positions. And I didn't think... Mitch Morse was the first one that surprised me. I didn't think we are going to be resetting money in that way. And this one was a huge surprise to me. Now, if it had happened next off season and we were able to, you know, swing a trade and the dead cap was only 12 million. Um, that's more where I expected this to happen. Um, like I said, there's who knows what's going on behind the scenes that we don't know about. Um, and it, it, it may have just been time for a change of scenery. Um, now, the one thing that seeing a ton of, you know, immediate reaction to this that's getting overlooked, I keep seeing uh, a picture shared on social media of, like, Josh Allen's top three targets next year, and it's got Curtis Samuel, Khalil Shakir, and um, Mac Collins in it. And I just... I. I think it's a gross oversight to in to not include Kincaid in that picture. It's one thing if you said, look at Josh Allen's receiving core right now or his wide receivers, um, but it even says the top three targets. Um, Kincaid really blossomed towards the tail end of last year. Um, first round pick, getting into another year in the system, another year with Josh Allen, and... I think we're so used to, you know, high flying wide receivers and, you know, the 11 personnel that it, it's, I don't know, easy to forget how good Kincaid was in his rookie year. Um, but I mean, that as it stands right now, that's your number one target going into next year. So just put that picture aside. Um, the other thing is here is prolific as Diggs has been. Um, over his tenure in Buffalo. When we look at kind of the tail end of last season, they're not really super hard numbers to replace, and we still had a very successful offense um, with Diggs being a shortcoming. And it wasn't just, you know, low yardage games it was like super inefficient games i'm just going to run through this is from week 10 on last year um three catches on five attempts for 34 yards uh four of eight for 27 six of 11 for 74 yards four for 11 for 24 four of five for 48 five of eight for 29 four of seven for 26 seven of eight for 87 7 of 9 for 52, and 3 of 8 for 21. I mean, are there things that goes into that? Are there other players that are getting more opportunity because, you know, the number one cornerback or double teams, whatever, is all shifting to digs? 
Yeah, sure. Um, but we've also seen Diggs be super productive um, through all those things, through the double coverages, through, you know, safeties rolling on top of him. And kind of the inefficiency numbers when we see, you know, like four of, four of 11 and six of 11, those feel to me like times where Josh Allen is kind of trying to force the ball into digs and, you know, was there somebody that could have been more open on the play? Um, is Josh Allen trying to force that ball in there because uh, he's worried about upsetting digs because he's a big personality? I'm not saying that the Bills immediately get better after this move. I'm saying I'm willing to to give it time and see how things play out. Um, I think there was a certain aspect of it was great while well, it lasted and it's kind of run its course. And like I said, this this can be a reset button. Um, now, as, as far as the mock drafts that I had um, went, there... <laughs> There's a ton of ad- adjusted needs that we're going to have to take another look at. Um, I kind of had the defensive line as a more more pressing need. Um, I, knew, I knew going into it that there'd be a ton of people out there that didn't like that. Um, with Stefan Diggs in the mix, with Kincaid getting another year, with Shakir emerging... Um, adding Curtis Samuel, who I think is a pretty good receiver who's had terrible quarterback play. Um, I still wanted to add receiver, but it was more kind of planning for life after digs. You know, a guy that can get a couple of years before, um, you know, being thrust into a, you know, a true number one receiver um, role. And it's kind of looking at the way Bean has historically built the trenches first and then kind of moved outwards I uh, and a really deep receiving class I was anticipating you know an unpopular defensive end or defensive tackle first and then receiver being addressed later um, I think that totally changes now um, I think moving up in the first round to get your guy is now in play um, I think maybe trading back and double dipping and getting two of these guys in the second round, maybe that's in play. Um, just one move changes the landscape so much uh, of where I expect the Bills to go now and, and how they do it. Um, I will say I've seen a ton out there about the Bills like getting hosed in this trade. Um, we'll leave the late round picks out of it, but... Um, the Bills receive a 2025 second round pick for Diggs and it's Minnesota's second round pick. I I think it's actually pretty decent return for an aging player that yes, still has juice in the tank, but also like if they're willing to move on now. Tells me that they were probably moving on next year anyways. And a second round pick for a Minnesota team and we'll see what they end up doing at the quarterback position through the draft but as it stands right now planning on starting Sam Darnold I don't imagine that they're going to be a very good football team and that's essentially you know a, a late late first round pick um, if things play out kind of how I think it's going to be um Minnesota seems to be a team that's rebuilding. Maybe they draft a a young quarterback early. Um, Who knows what happens with Minnesota, but I don't think it's going to be a situation where Minnesota's, you know, sniffing at the Super Bowl and you're getting, you know, basically a third round pick for Diggs. I I think this is going to be a pretty early second round pick. Um, And maybe being able to use that pick to you know parlay some some moves up the board here um maybe convert it into some draft capital this year i think that'd be my only complaint on the return is that it's a 2025 pick um i think with the talent at the receiver position this year i don't anticipate them holding on to that for next year 
Uh, I think we see that used to maybe move up in the first, um, maybe get themselves a couple picks in the third round this year. We'll see how it shakes out, but overall, it's kind of been a roller coaster day for me here. Um, just kind of sorting through, starting at what the hell is going on. Didn't think there was any possible way to this happening to, okay, well, let, let's look at what the long-term plan here is. Uh, and I think there's a few things to consider. I mean, first and foremost, I think Brandon Bean's been overall a very good GM for the Bills. And I don't think that I don't think that he's a fan of taking on dead cap, and I don't think that he would have made this move lightly, and I don't think he would have made this move without the next plan in place. Um, I think also something that's going to get lost in the shuffle here, um, when you have a franchise quarterback like Josh Allen, you're not making a move like this without him being consulted and him giving the okay on it. Um, so like I said, maybe the organization kind of kept it a little bit more buttoned up last year throughout the season, but maybe that relationship wasn't, wasn't quite where we thought it was, you know, looking at the off season. And I think this is also a situation where when we talk about resetting the money, you can double dip a receiver in this draft. You can have, you know, Curtis Samuel, Shakir, Kincaid. You can lump all those guys together. And and you're talking, you know, four, five, six players whose cap hit is going to be less cumulatively um, than Diggs was in one year. And, you know, I I have some friends texting me, you know, the initial reaction of, Oh, this means we're trading for T. Higgins, or oh, here comes Brandon Ayuk. I would get myself excited for that, and I think those are great players that could immediately help this team. But I don't think that's the premise of being making this move. I think this is following an off season of making tough decisions to get a younger, cheaper roster, and. We've seen Brandon Bean double dip several times in drafts, and I, I think you see that this year. And I don't think he waits till like the fifth round to take the second receiver. I think you see two meaningful investments at receiver early in the draft this year, and you kind of take that take that young cheap talent. You hope that it produces right away and you're able to spend the money elsewhere. You're able to have a few year little you know buffer here coming up where um you're kind of reset to I don't want to say that where the cap was when they came in um but being able to have cap flexibility again and not going into every off season of you know do we have to restructure digs and Allen to even get cap compliant um I think we saw this year being saved save a couple of levers um, that could have created more cap space. And I think that's kind of with an eye towards the future. And I don't think that's to say that, you know, a move like this means that the Bills aren't competing next year. Um, I think this is the time where you kind of bet on your elite quarterback being able to elevate some people, bring some people along quicker, make a guy like Curtis Samuel, you know, be the receiver that a lot of people think that he can be, um, continue developing with Shakir Kincaid, add some pieces, and just able to reset the room with cheap talent and be able to get back to, you know, kind of reset the clock on on the salary cap where we've just kind of been pushing everything down the road and this core is close. We're going to get over the hump, push it down the road another year um, versus now just being able to have that reset button while still being competitive. And 
for people out there saying, you know, they don't think the Bills are going to make the playoffs this year. Um, just kind of looking at the landscape of the AFC East, um, the Dolphins are having salary cap trouble and they haven't even extended, uh, they haven't even given a contract to Tua yet. They had to let, um, they had to let big name players walk already. Um, Tyree Kill's expensive. Jalen Waddle's coming up for a contract. Uh, then you look at the Patriots. Um, they're probably going to draft a quarterback this year, but the way things have been moving there, still not concerned with them as an immediate threat. Maybe they start building towards a semblance of competitive again. Um, and then the Jets. The Jets looking like they're pushing it all in again. Um, we kind of saw how that went last year for them. Granted, you know, Aaron Rodgers gets gets hurt week one. Um, but, I mean, they're kind of pushing all their eggs into the basket of doing it again this year, you know, with a 40-something-year-old quarterback coming off a serious injury another year older um, behind a line that hasn't been good. Um, I, I, I can see a world where the Jets are competitive this year. I also think they're closer to firing their head coach and their GM than they are to winning a Super Bowl. Um, just that comboed with, you know, how much the Bills have, how much success they've had inside the division, um, how much talent we still have on defense. You know, despite losing your number one receiver, you still have a, wherever you want to rank them, a top three quarterback in the league. Um, you have a first round pick receiving option from last year. You have James Cook that emerged last year. Um, I just don't think this puts us back as far as people's initial response is, is seeming to be for me. Um, I think we also have to account for, you know, the post June 1st designation for Trey White's release. You're going to get another $10 million in cap space there. Um, there's still a lot of time and a lot of creativity Bean can have constructing this roster. Um, I think it all starts with the draft. So certainly, you know, about two hours ago, three hours ago, I was at, holy shit, the sky is falling. Things got traded. Um, but kind of letting a few hours sink in, you know, kind of, think through the X's and O's of it. Um, certainly makes the draft more interesting, and we'll see what happens there. Um, but yeah, that's that's it for this week. Um, I'm going to try to do the mock drafts again next week with a you know fully different perspective on, on where I think, what I think this draft is going to look like. Um, Certainly wild, weird news to to kind of start my day with today. Um, like I said, I, I think Bean's been a, a very successful GM in Buffalo. I don't think this is a move that he would make lightly. I don't think it's a move that he would make without the next three steps in place. Um, so we'll see what happens there. Uh, make sure you're subscribed. So you're not missing any episodes like this when some wild breaking news happens. Um, Going to try to do the mock drafts again for next week, see how things shake out. Um, but thank you again for tuning in. Um, chin up, we still got Josh Allen, and we'll talk to you next week. Go Bills!